bureaucracy in particular, rather than finance, rather than staffing. I just wondered um, what your views were on that in terms of Scotland's NHS. And also, just going back to James's question, when he was on LBC this morning, he accused your government and the UK government of using the GRR bill as a, a devolution, a constitutional political football, and that this is not a political matter, but in fact a legal one if there's going to be a challenge. I wondered if well, I, I don't really have anything to add on the GRR uh, point uh, in addition to what I said to James earlier on, except to say, you know, it's only coming a constitutional issue because we've got Westminster politicians refusing to accept the right of the Scottish Parliament to legislate in an area of its own competence and making unwarranted and completely unjustified threats to challenge that legislation. So if anybody's trying to use it politically, it's those Westminster politicians. Uh, the Scottish Parliament, including Keir Starmer's own party, uh, with one or two exceptions, uh, voted for that bill. You know, one of... Uh, the amendments that m puts on the face of the bill, uh, to put it beyond doubt, that it doesn't affect the Equality Act, came from a Labour uh, or originated with a Labour MSP. So those comments to Keir Star uh, from Keir Starmer, uh, he needs to understand that this is not simply a proposal that's been passed by the SNP. This is a proposal, piece of legislation that's been passed by the Scottish Parliament, by a significant majority, MSPs across all parties and the vast majority of MSPs in his own party. And I think he needs to uh, reflect very seriously on that. Um, as to his comments on the NHS, I, I found his comments yesterday pretty dispiriting, uh, to be perfectly uh, frank. Uh, yes, and we talk a lot uh, about this, the reforming of patient pathways and how care is delivered in the NH NHS, that is underway. And, in Scotland and will continue. The see and treat, hear and treat initiatives, hospital at home that I've spoken about, the uh, shift to primary care, multidisciplinary teams in primary care settings, all of that is important. I think some of what he was saying yesterday was you know, quite dangerous in respects and some of the advice he might have been giving to people with potentially very serious conditions not to go to their, their GP or, or to look for ways to bypass their GPs. But I'll uh, not say any more about that because he may have not intended to say exactly what he did. But I think what people in the UK, across the UK, probably want to hear from the leader of the opposition at UK level, somebody who is aspiring to be prime minister over the next couple of years, is a commitment to invest more in the health service would be a commitment to reverse Brexit so that some of the recruitment challenges that are being exacerbated by the loss of freedom of movement can be overcome. You know, we're investing to the maximum that we can in NHS Scotland. We're asking those uh, who earn most to pay a bit more tax using our income tax powers. Uh, so we're doing what we can to maximise the investment going to the NHS, but to go beyond that, we need to see a UK government that actually lifts the level of investment in the NHS. That's a point I was making to the Prime Minister when I saw him uh, last Thursday evening. I don't have very much hope that a Tory uh, government is going to do that, but surely people would expect to hear from uh, the Labour leader aspiring to replace a Tory government actual commitments to significant additional investment in the NHS. And for there to be a complete lack of that, I think most people, not just me, uh, will find that really dispiriting at a time when people uh, hope to hear more and better from a Labour leader. And I say again, you know, Keir Starmer needs to stop trying to be a pale imitation of the Tory government he's seeking uh, to replace and actually start offering some positive alternative. Uh, Neil Poorin from PA. Thanks, First Minister. In terms of your plans to discharge hospital patients into care homes, which you spoke about last week, can you first of all confirm how many um, and how many cases that's taken place uh, within the last week? And also, have there been any reports of increased infections in care homes as a result of this? Uh, this is something that care home relatives in Scotland have been concerned about, as it would mean that the, the care homes shut down to, to them visiting the relatives. Uh, I'll ask the Health Secretary and the Chief Medical Officer to add, but obviously infection is, is monitored in care homes as it is in, in hospitals, and infection control processes and procedures uh, remain important. Um, obviously, the guidance uh, to implement the commitment and the announcement that was made last week was issued and that is work in progress. Uh, we will start to see the figures coming to the Resilience Committee this week to show progress and of course we'll uh, look uh, to see how and in what uh, form we can share that uh, with you. Uh, the additional beds though that we announced the commitment to fund last week is on top of uh, 600 beds that are being used for interim care already in care homes. So again, 
you know, this is not something that is completely new. This is something that has been used to help with current pressures in recent times, and uh, last week's announcement builds on. Yeah, th th thanks so much. Very little to add to that. I just think it's just worth reiterating the point that I made last week that, um, of course, those numbers of delayed discharges are not a static number. People are constantly coming in and out of uh, the, 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 the system and being discharged, um, and, and, and vast majority, over 95%, being discharged actually uh, on time. So we have really well established procedures when it comes to discharge into a care home, whether that's an interim place, of which uh, the First Minister is right, there's uh, already 600 beds uh, being used, or of course, whether that's on a permanent basis. So we have really good infection prevention control uh, measures uh, in place. Uh, we were up front last week uh, in saying, and I was up front uh, in saying throughout the week, that. Uh, the high levels of flu we were seeing and COVID, for example, may well mean that some care homes uh, will have to restrict their admissions, uh, not, not stop them altogether, but restrict their admissions, and that may uh, well uh, slow progress <coughs> in terms of the numbers we're looking uh, to discharge. But the good news on that, of course, is that uh, flu and COVID vaccination rates in our care homes uh, are exceptionally high amongst residents. Okay. Neil, what we've been doing over the last few weeks in the lead-up certainly to the festive period is keeping a very close eye on the number of outbreaks that we're seeing uh, in care homes. And you know, They come about for a variety of different reasons. Um, it's not just flu and COVID, but, but other infectious pressures such as norovirus as well. So monitoring all those and seeing exactly where that picture is developing. And in the run-up through December, we were beginning to see those outbreaks becoming more apparent, the numbers increasing through the festive period. Uh, at that point, they were beginning to... Um, to, to, to kind of crest and peak. And of course, these are a reflection of the disease burden that there is in the community. There's a direct correlation between how much infection you have within communities and therefore how likely it is that those are then likely to be uh, passed on into care homes. We're now seeing that picture beginning to stabilise as some of the community pressures in terms of infection are beginning to stabilise as well. We continue to keep a close eye on it, obviously, um, but at this moment, there appears to be a stabilising picture. Matt McLaughlin from The Times. Morning, First Minister. Has there been any impact um, of the teacher strikes uh, on NHS staffing, securing part-time staff, agency staff, or even full-time staff having to take time off to care for children? Um, I am not aware that that is the case in any meaningful sense, but I'll ask Councillor. No, exactly that, First Minister. We get the absence uh, figures for NHS staff uh, every single week. And look at last week's uh, figures, it generally followed the, the trend that we saw in terms of viral uh, infections. I'll get this week's figures uh, later uh, on this week, but I'm not anticipating, certainly from the feedback and, and the engagement that I've had with health boards up and down the country, it's not a significant uh, factor in a, in, in a meaningful sense. Joseph Anderson from the Scotsman. <coughs> uh, thank you, First Minister. After you announced funding to free up community beds at last week's briefing, the Royal College of Nursing and Scottish Care expressed concerns about the plan, saying they're unlikely to work without addressing vacancies and staffing levels, but how can you make a career in the NHS attractive if you won't even pay them what they feel they deserve? Well, we in Scotland, of course, are already uh, offering a pay rise this year that is significantly uh, above what has been offered elsewhere in the UK. Um, that is a pay rise on top of NHS pay that in on average is already higher than in the rest of the UK, and that differential uh, will grow. And we are now uh, negotiating intensively or about to be negotiating intensively about next year's uh, pay rise and you'll have seen uh, some of the uh, latest developments at the end of last week uh, which means and you know I uh, as I said last week I, I, I'm not complacent about this at all but we remain um, the only part of the UK that hasn't seen NHS workers going in strike uh, which I think is an indication of the fact, A, that we do value NHS workers and want to pay them as much as we can within the resources we've got, and that while NHS trade unions uh, are always very robust in arguing uh, the interests of their members, there is an ability to sit down around a table and negotiate with them, and we'll continue uh, to take that forward. Uh, on the point about care home beds, I mean, this is about interim care to help uh, speed up discharge from hospital and reduce delayed discharges. It's not the uh, overall single solution to the pressures that the NHS is facing. Uh, and of course, what we're talking about here are available staffed care home beds. Yeah. Um, and that is important beds that are already uh, staffed, but not currently occupied.
Do you want to add anything? The only thing I'd add is that's one of the reasons why we agreed the funding to be able to cover above 25% above the National Care Home contract, because it was coming back, feedback from Scottish Care, for example, uh, and others who sit in our ministerial advisory group, uh, that, that although, uh, first Mrs. absolutely right, we're looking at staffed uh, beds, uh, the way to help with that in the interim, with interim care beds, <coughs> might be that we have to pay above and beyond the National Care Home contract rate. So that is one of the reasons uh, why the funding that was announced last week allows, uh, allows us to, to be able to to do that, but nothing to add further to, to Okay, that. thanks. Uh, my list now says Simon Johnson from The Telegraph, but I'm also not seeing Simon, I don't think. Um, nope. In that case, I'll go to Chris Green from The Independent. Thanks, First Minister. Um, just, to, just another figure question. Um, I think last week you gave the figures on the level of delayed discharge as 1,700 patients. I just wondered if there was an update this week on that. And also, um, can we expect any further action to be announced in terms of uh, a ministerial statement or anything this week? Um, firstly, on delayed discharge, I mean, obviously, we publish uh, official statistics periodically on uh, delayed discharge. So what I'm uh, citing right now is, is management figures. And remember, uh, it's a really obvious point, but I think it is one that is, is always worth uh, pointing out that the, the delayed discharge figure is not a static figure. It reflects uh, admissions and discharges. So the figure is probably broadly, I think, at the moment, uh, similar to what it was uh, last week. Uh, but of course, we continue uh, to try to get it down to uh, speed up the discharge of those who are technically defined as delayed discharges, but the initiative I spoke about uh, in my opening remarks of asking all health boards to review all discharge plans right now to see if we can ensure uh, that even people who are uh, perhaps not meeting the definition of a delayed discharge but might have a, a barrier to their discharge, that work has been done to reduce that as well. Okay. Uh, Lucanio Meander from the Financial Times. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, if I may go back to on the gender reform bill, I was just going to check, in the, in the event that the UK government does act to block it, what would your options be? What, how will you react? What will you actually do about it? And then secondly, I'm just wondering, uh, is the fact that you're having these press conferences, is it a sign that politically, like you have some evidence that maybe the he negative headlines about the NHS are hurting the, the SNP? Uh, on the last point, no, um, and you can read polling evidence as well as I can, so I, you know, I'm not in receipt of any information that you don't already have. Um, I'm trying to be accessible to the media. Um, if, if we weren't, no doubt we'd be getting questions about why not. So I, I think on these kind of things, it's uh, yeah, damned if you do, damned if you don't. So um, I, as I did during the pandemic, try to be open to your questions and to your scrutiny, and I think it's uh, an important thing to do. Um, on the GRR point, I'm not going to repeat everything I've already said there, but we will vigorously defend the legislation. Um, depending on if there is a challenge, and I, I hope there won't be, but the indications would suggest that uh, that may be what we are looking at. It will depend what route to that the UK government takes. If it's uh, Section 33 challenge, then that will go to the Supreme Court, as I understand it, and we will defend the bill in the Supreme Court. If it's a Section 35 challenge, uh, that would require, I think, the Scottish Government to uh, judicially review uh, that decision. But these are uh, technicalities. What I can say in general is that we will absolutely, robustly and rigorously, and with a very, very, very high degree of confidence, uh, defend the legislation. Uh, Kate Foster from the Daily Mail. Minister. Um, given the pressures on a and &E in hospitals just now, um, if there was to be a major incident in Scotland, such as a bus crash or a train crash, um, would a and &E departments and hospitals be able to respond to that and give the appropriate care to patients? Um, what are the contingency measures for that? Um, yes, they would. And uh, we have a high degree of confidence in our NHS to respond to major incidents, and that is... Uh, demonstrated on the sad occasions when we have uh, major incidents, all health boards will have contingency plans in place for a variety of eventualities. Uh, Rachel Watson from The Sun. Thank you, First Minister. Um, I just want to ask about school strikes again. We know following lockdown about the concerns around mental health, education and social um, skills of children, um, the concerns that are around there. Education has now been disrupted again by the strikes. Are you concerned about the impact this is having on children? And yesterday the EIS called for you to show the same urgency to getting a pay resolution with teachers as you have the NHS. Are you going to step in? Um, I, I always get um, slightly, uh, well, I reflect on uh, questions about me stepping in. I, I, I never step out of government. I'm always involved in in these issues. Um, 
Of course I'm concerned about industrial action in our schools because I don't want to see that impact on young people um, and I don't want to see teachers having to take industrial action. I think what we have demonstrated, uh, particularly or most recently, it's not the only example, but most recently in the NHS is that we are not a government that simply digs our heels in in industrial disputes. We are a government that seeks to find resolutions to disputes a government that tries to treat public sector workers as fairly as we possibly can to maximise pay increases within the resources we've got and to avoid industrial action. And we stand ready, willing, and there are, uh, you know, have been talks last week and they will continue to do that with teachers as well. Uh, but as we also see in the NHS, it does involve compromise on both sides. And, you know, therefore, I hope we will see that compromise uh, on both both sides, and remember, uh, unlike the NHS, COSLA is a, a partner in teacher pay negotiations, um, and I hope we will see that compromise that gets to a resolution. But we are not, uh, and I think this is well evidenced, we're not a government that simply digs our heels in and refuses to talk to trade unions. Uh, and lastly, Louise Wilson from Holyrood. Uh, morning, Press Minister. Um, I just want to ask quickly on the legislation that the UK government are putting through about strikes and minimum service levels. You've already said that you're against that legislation. I was wondering if you would refuse to cooperate on enforcement of that, much like you did with the trade union bill in 2015-16, if that were to pass. Um, we will certainly uh, not be a willing uh, implementer of any trade union uh, legislation of that nature. I had a discussion with the Prime Minister about this uh, last Thursday when I saw him. Now, it depends, the ability of the Scottish Government to, to do different things will depend on the framing of not just the primary legislation, which is very, very vague in the details that it includes, but the secondary legislation. That, in my view, that bill, uh, given you know, employment law is reserved, unfortunately, and I regrettably accept that that right now is the reality, but the implementation of legislation like this, if you look at the sectors that are supposed to be covered by it, uh, with one or possibly two exceptions, are devolved services. So deciding whether a minimum level of service was required and what that should be would be down to devolved services. So my view is uh, that the legislation, well, the legislation shouldn't happen, take that as read, but if the government is intent on going forward with it, they should not apply it to Scotland, uh, but if they do apply it to Scotland, they should give the power to Scottish ministers to decide whether or not to, to implement it in the sectors affected. So I made those points uh, strongly to the Prime Minister and we'll see uh, what the response is in coming weeks and months. Any final comments, Gregor? No, no nothing to add. Okay, in that case, thank you all very much for your time.